All right, so I've got Kevin here with me. How's it going, my friend? All good. All good, good. Well, sweet. Well, I'm excited to, to do this. Um, I've only done this with one other person, Brett, uh, your colleague, a while ago, which we were talking about a slightly different topic, um, but uh, over at Bonfires. But I wanted to dive into something that I think a lot of B2B marketers and also founders and CEOs are talking about, which is the whole growth at all costs and now moving more to, towards sustainable growth. And um, before we get into all that and get into the fun stuff, um, maybe just tell me real quick about you, the company, SEOP, who you guys typically work with in terms of a startup, uh, what's a good fit, things of that nature, just so people have some context on where you're coming from. Sounds good. So it's, it's Scott. Uh, we're Scott. great at picking names that no one knows how Sweet. to uh, Good. Say, so. And SCOP actually was a joke. It st stands for scale, Scalable Opportunities, which... Oh, I love it. And thanks for correcting me. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Some people say side cop. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anyways. I, yeah, love it. So our, our focus is really on, I mean, primarily SaaS companies. I mean, we love vertical SaaS. I believe that every, every industry is going to be a tech company, uh, especially, right. especially now with AI. And that, uh, you know, we're looking for people with about a million dollars in ARR. It helps mm -hmm. us get over the sort of product market set. Um, shows the thing we put together a team, shows they have grit. Um, you know, going from zero to a million is, is probably the hardest part. So that's when yep. we come in and help them try to figure out how to grow. Got it. Love it. Love it. And then the team's all based out of, I know you're out of California, but where's the team all based? We're in Santa Barbara. And I think mm -hmm. what makes us a bit different from most VCs is that, you know, we're not, I would knock against business school. Business schools are great, but. We tend to come from the entrepreneurs, you know, perspective. We've all been entrepreneurs building companies. Yep. And we bring a lot of operational sort of expertise rather than sort of I don't know, academic financial modeling. Uh, that's right. not what we're about. Right. It's a much tighter relationship with the entrepreneur versus just saying, hey, here's the cash and we'll do our quarterly review. And hopefully you're hitting some of the initial milestones where we're looking for. You guys are a little closer and work with the entrepreneur to make sure they're really successful. Yeah. And, you know, entrepreneurs ask like, how do you guys work with us? What's your playbook? We, we don't have a playbook. You know, everyone is different. Some people are exceptionally strong technically and don't have yep. to go to market. Exactly. Uh, some people, you know, with you, almost yeah. everyone struggles with sort of demand gen. Uh, right. There you go. You know, and I that I mentor a lot of people because I've been CEO for a long time. And, right. And, you know, sort of mentor slash therapist for, uh, for the lonely Java CEO. I should start charging for that therapist. Maybe I should uh, put that on our website. It's another type of retainer for people that just need to kind of vent and uh, complain about things and how things are moving. But uh, yeah, well, cool. Well, that's a good, that's a good intro uh, just to kind of give people some context on where you're coming from. But I wanted to have this. So I don't know how many people saw this. Um, I know you, of course, did and everyone in the investor community. And I think there's probably other reports and blogs and all sorts of stuff that was written. But Anyway, the Sequoia one that came out back last year in May stood out to me and I read through the whole thing. And, you know, there were some interesting takeaways, uh, a lot of different things being said in that. But my overall uh, takeaway was that Sequoia was really coming at this and saying, listen, like, this is about really getting more sustainable and profitable at this point. Capital is now a lot more expensive and we can't continue this growth at all costs mindset. And I know that at least for as long as I can remember, and you certainly have more years of experience than I do. The growth at all cost mindset has been very common even before COVID. That was the thing, right? Pour as much money as we can into tech companies, make them be the category leaders as quickly as possible, kill the competition. And um, so I wanted to maybe step back and like see how you think about that and your take on the whole Sequoia paper, which I'm sure you read, but just the differences of like, what's the difference between growth at all costs? Or I think you put it like get, get big fast and sustainable growth in your, in your opinion. You know, it, it's funny. We used to call it get big fast back in the, in the dot com days. And yeah, you know, these are all failed strategies. Um, and you know, it, and it, ha it applies to all sorts of different industries. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, we used to call it the new economy. Well, I didn't call it. I thought the new economy was a bunch of bullshit. So <laughs> there is no new economy. There are no new economic laws. There are no new business principles. Um, I think, you know, this, they get big fast, you know, where there's cheap money makes people stupid. 
Mm, uh, agreed. And business is really, you know, we've always pushed this. Business is really, really simple. Um, someone has identified a really big problem and come up with a, the best solution mm. to that problem. Um, that's the hard part. Then there's a lot of other stuff you got to figure out. Like what's the operating model? What's the business model? What's the unit economics? You know, like what, how do you build a company that you can scale, you know, back to the scope, scalable opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything you do as a business is a hypothesis and you're testing, you're constantly testing. Once you've got something where you have a high degree of confidence and then you can scale it. You know, now you're a growth company. Mm -hmm. The problem that happens with, with a lot of these companies you know, there's three reasons companies fail. Three top three reasons, lots of reasons, but three top reasons. Yeah. One is they don't actually solve a problem. I believe yeah. it or not. Uh, one is they don't yeah. raise enough money. And then the third one, which is surprising, they raise too much money. And too right. much money makes people stupid. And mm -hmm. it makes, you know, entrepreneurs often feel who've never raised money before feel like, oh, I, I, I'm successful now. You know, I've got someone to breathe right. in. And what they don't realize is they don't have a scalable um, company. And mm -hmm. so they replicate their problems all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then they spend money trying to clean up those problems. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've never been a believer in it. I think it's been a big mistake. I think it's a flaw in our, in our, in our industry, the venture community. Right. Um, part of it is that, you know, these funds have raised massive amounts of money. Mm -hmm. uh, most of general partners have less than 1% of their own money in it. Uh, mm -hmm which is, I find absurd in our fund. I have a, a, I'm, I'm a third of our fund. Um, wow. You know, because I believe in what we're doing. So I'm very mm -hmm. cautious about how we invest money, but so the venture community is just raised huge amounts of money and they have to spend it. Um, right. And so they just flood these companies. There is some, we looked at a couple of deals we passed on. I won't say who it was top tier VCEs were, were giving 250 times, um, uh, you know, valuations on revenue. I mean, that's, that's a sure. you, you can never, never dig out of that. So I, I don't know. I, I think the, the venture community, I don't know what's, I don't know what's going on. Uh, and here we are, we're reverting back to, you know, building good businesses. Well, and to me, I, I always just find it funny that we even ever left. I mean, you know, uh, it's, I don't know, for me, it's always been a quality over quantity game. And it's always been about doing a few things right first, being focused with who you're actually going after and having intention about it versus saying, hey, we've got this massive TAM. Let's just go after the whole thing. Let's go for it and see what happens, right? Versus saying, no, no, like there's an actual market opportunity in this specific segment because we have limited resources and limited budget. We can't do it all, right? So there has to be some level of focus, unless, of course, you're in the world where you just have a VC that believes in growth at all costs and is pumping you up with as much money as possible. And it's just let it rain, right? And pump up metrics and hire tons of people. And that's where you get founders, of course, that it seems to be almost like the celebration is raising money and the celebration is how many people they've hired. And it's like, oh, we've grown from three to 30. And to me, I always find that funny because it's like, isn't it more important to be optimizing for revenue per employee and a certain metric there versus just the number of employees you have? I don't know. What's your take on that? You have a different take? Yeah. I, I mean, sort of back to the last thing, which was, you know, how did we get there? Uh, some of it, I think, is, is either McKinsey or Bain came out with this thing. Probably. Right. And it's, it is true that every market devolves into three players. And the first, mm -hmm. the number one player is, it's kind of winner take all. They they accrue most of the most of the right. payments. And then it became like this first mover advantage. Like if I move first, I'm more likely to get it. And it's just mm. simply not true. I mean, it is true that industries over time devolve into, into the top three players. Mm. But first mover advantage is a is a is a myth. Um, you know, Google was like search engine number twenty. I mean, it was right. Really not. Where's Ask really? Jeeves? Exactly. It's it's like who who gets it right. Um, and then back to, I'm sorry, back to your last question, which was. Well, it was really going into like, what was your take around like the whole idea of focusing, targeting we were talking about and how a lot of people will come in and just say, Hey, here's a TAM. And I sold this to my investors and they gave me some money and let's just go after all of it and see what happens versus having some level of, Hey, we actually want to focus on this given segment because we feel like we have a more differentiated product against the competition. 
and have a better chance of being successful versus just going wild and spending money. I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, the two things that, that we tend to harp on, which is, you know, in most markets, there's sort of this, this secret. So there's like, like the perfect way of doing something or the most, mm -hmm. most perfect way. And in Google was an example, you know, with the, the page rank, right? They, they found this, this feature that was so important. Um, and so I think companies always have to be focused to finding what it is that's going to unlock that market to make them, that's going to make them the most successful player in that market. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, it's great to have a great, to have confidence, but you also have, you have to have enough humility to know that you may be wrong. Right. There's plenty of pivots. There's plenty of shifting, you know, where it's like, okay, we we're closed, but we need to shift over here. Um, right. And once you find that, and that really comes down to what you said is focus. Um, yep. The biggest problem we see in startups is, is I call it the entrepreneur's curse, which is they're really, really creative. Let's have lots of ideas and they tend to pursue all the ideas. So right. it's like the guy that plays risk that puts a piece on every country, you know, he get wiped out, you know, immediately. Right. So, it's all about focus is like, okay, here's our two or three hypotheses, focus all our resources on to testing those, finding something that scales and then put our resources behind scaling that. Right. Do you think there's like, there's too focused? I mean, where you can, I mean, I think about it in the sense of from an investment perspective, right? I've got a portfolio of investments. If I put all my money in Apple and then Apple didn't become Apple, then clearly that would be a, a risky and it's a more risky decision with potentially high return if I put all my money in that based on being focused. But do you think from, you know, when you're breaking down a tab, uh, TAM into different segments, do you think there's a point where you can get too focused and then it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know, we're maybe missing out on another opportunity because I think that's where a lot of founders and VPs of marketing struggle with. It's like, well, I don't really want to focus all of my advertising or all of my whatever what, based on what they're doing for a marketing program on this one thing, because if I'm wrong, then I'm screwed. And so I wonder if there's a balance there in your mind, like when you're talking to their founders and whatnot of trying to juggle the, you know, you want maybe a couple of things moving where you can get a little data back, but you still want to have some driving focus in a given area, right? Any, any thoughts there? What? I think it depends on the stage, right? So, so let's yeah. say you're first starting out. Um, the first thing to do is you don't know the answer. So you need to run some tests. So yeah, we tend to brainstorm a lot. We say, okay, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's 10 possible solutions. Mm -hmm. Here are the two or, th two or three possible solutions that we have the most confidence. Mm -hmm. And then we'll test. So you're right. You know, we wouldn't narrow it down to just one. We do two or three, we test them. And everything in life, everything in business is a game of probability. So, so hopefully out of, out of those two or three things, you find something that works. Yeah, then exactly. You, then you focus, then you take that. And you scale the crap out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, completely, completely agreed. But, but also continue to run tests, you know, in other areas, like never. Right. You know, you try to optimize, try to get more efficient on that one channel that scales, but you're also looking for other channels that you can do it. Right. And I mean, ultimately at the end of the day with channels, it's all about figuring out where is your audience? If you're going after this segment, where are they hanging out? Where are their eyeballs? Where are they listening? And so whether that's a podcast, whether that's uh, a specific newsletter you can sponsor, whether that's LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it may be, it's finding those channels where they're spending time so that ultimately you can deliver a message and or content to get on their radar, make them aware of a problem they didn't know about, or make them aware that you're the solution that solves a problem they already know about, so on and so forth. So yeah, agreed. Well, I wanted to go back. Okay. I'm, yeah. Go I was going to say, I'm sure I've seen this many, many times in market, demand gen marketing is like, yeah. Like let's spend a lot of money on a lot of different things, or let's spend a, a little bit of money on a lot of different things. Uh, and right. not really, not really generate either statistical well, significance or you exactly. your marketing budget. So even if you do find something, you're, you're done. Well, that's the stuff that gives me heartburn because I mean, at the end of the day, obviously we're in a business to help clients be successful, right? If we weren't, then we'd just be a, a churn factory, right? And it just wastes a lot of money, a lot of people's money, but. At the end of the day, it drives me nuts because ultimately some of these things, at least at our level, like where we're sitting as more of the consulting partner to a SaaS business, we're not controlling the business strategy and that all these other elements of what they're focused on. Certainly there's some elements where we're like, okay, wait a minute. I think we're going too big here. We've got an audience of 
250,000 people in the specific audience, maybe it's 10,000, 15,000 accounts. That's a lot of people in there. Do we actually have messaging that we can distribute to that audience effectively that actually is really relevant to all of them? Because a lot of times what we see is that you've got a lot of broad-based messaging that maybe generally on the surface kind of sounds good or clever, but it really isn't ultimately getting the message across that you're trying to communicate because you've got such a broad audience and maybe there's a handful of people in there that respond to it, but there's so many that aren't. So you're wasting all this money from an advertising perspective on this massive audience when you could have scaled down that message a little bit, made it a little more specific to either an industry, a persona, or end user, decision makers, all sorts of ways you can cut it. And so for me, like that's that's the biggest pain is, you know, and ultimately it's the client's decision if they want to go after the whole, the whole world, the whole market, right? But uh, for us, it's difficult because we know that ultimately it's going to come back on us or the in-house team or whoever, and we want them to be successful. So it's a, it's a tough battle. No, I mean, uh, you know, we saw it all the time at DoubleClick, you know, it's just like, yeah, you know, and look, when I first started as an entrepreneur, I thought, I thought advertising was the panacea. Like I've ever taken on an ad uh, in the industry thing and we actually got hired temporary people and put in new phone lines to handle the inbound calls because it was going to be so great. And like, not a single person call. Um, right. Yeah. And, you know, that was my sort of baptism in, in, in advertising. Well, and I think you know, some people, yeah, go ahead. One of the things we do with companies is because of that messaging problem, tech companies tend to be, you know, look at my product, look at the features. Like no one gives a, sh- no one gives a crap about your, your product for features. <laughs> they hear that all the time. 100%. We really try to take it. I'm sure you do this too. What is the fundamental problem that you're solving? What's the pain point of the customer? And that's what yep. you're addressing. That's what your mess- messaging is all about. Yep. People miss that all the time. Yeah, I think there's an interesting framework because there's the, um, yeah, there's the problem that you're talking about. We're going, this is a nice little uh, side rail off the, the main conversation, but let's do it. Um, but there's a way that I think about it where you've got, you know, feature and one header or column on an Excel spreadsheet. You've got the capability, which is what it actually does. And then you have the outcome that it drives. And you may have problem baked in there too. And it kind of depends on what messages you want to push. But for example, Clearbit might be the capability for them is that they've got data that connects personal emails with work emails. So you can do firmographic based targeting on Facebook. And so like, that's the feature. That's what it does. And the capability, the thing that people want is I want to, to build an audience firmographically and target people on Facebook. And so you might write an ad like that because that's ultimately what I want. But then what that drives is, you know, less wasted ad spend, lower CPLs, cost per leads. And so that's the outcome. But the message of outcome by itself wouldn't really resonate as much because I don't have any context of what it is. And so I think a lot of people get trapped in that outcome-based language stuff too, where it's always like drive revenue, drive pipeline. And then you're like, wait a minute, (laughs) what does it do again? Just tell me like in layman's terms, what's the problem you guys are trying to go after? And then tell me what it does, you know? Yes. So. Yes. But it's where, where do you start? So you're right. You start with sort of like, here's my pain point, you know, and then here's how we're doing it. Uh, Because everyone promises more money, cheaper. Always, always. Yeah. Everything. Um, but you can be very specific, you know, you want to be clear, but like you, you, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, it's probably a bad example yeah. because I don't know about it, but yeah, you can't go too broad. You can be pretty specific, but what is, what is the, the pain point that you can actually address? Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, you mentioned something earlier, um, or maybe to kind of pull it back rather a little bit, but we were kind of a little bit talking about testing uh, to a degree. And I don't want to get into like a whole testing um, conversation necessarily in the depths of it. But uh, the question was kind of, you know, in terms of like tactics and strategies or things like that with other entrepreneurs, maybe you're working with right now in your portfolio or just in general, just your general kind of perspective. Where do you think SaaS companies are bleeding the most money that maybe need to be cut or need to be thought about differently? Are there any things that come to mind on that? Because I think testing was one of the things you said they're not doing enough of, but anything outside of that, or, or you want to go deeper on that? Yeah. I mean, I'd say, I mean, look, we, we initially focused very much on product. So what you were talking about before, like some, some people may come to you and say, you know, I got a crappy product, but I marketing will overcome it. It's like, it just doesn't, right. right? You got to have, you don't control product. So the first point is like, you got to get good product and you got to get you know, the first 10 sales are the hardest. So once you got that down, 
mm. um, where we see most people wasting money is on the demand gen side. And it's not the, mm. it's not the, no, it's true to play get you or, you know, but it's, it's, that's why we actually came to, to speak with you is that this is where I think companies struggle the most. They just, they don't understand the demand gen side. They're not measuring, um, you know, uh, uh, CAC, uh, tracking CAC to LTV. And I know it's hard because there's, you know, there's a big time delay, um, mm -hmm. or they take sort of the wrong early indicators. So, I mean, you know, look, the perfect, as you know, the perfect one is the channel, you track it all the way through the sale. That can be a very long process and exactly. spend a lot of money. So what is sort of the earlier one? So some people will go to like MQLs, you know, I mm -hmm. hate the word MQL. I just, <laughs> to me, that's, those are garbage. So uh, do a lot really, of people. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's sales. SQL. It's a, you know, sales certified lead. Like this is a, right. a prospect or what's the next step? You know, is it a demo? Is it something where you get better and better data, uh, for, for the ultimate conversion, which is a sale. Mm -hmm. Um, right. but people are not often tracking that or they, or they're, they're not normalizing it. So, you know, right. all SQLs aren't equal. Um, or yeah, all, all our team department do it SQL, which is, or they're paying rewarding marketing based on SQL. So, you know, they'll get you lots of MQLs, but yeah, that's not what you want. I, I think that's why, I think you said it well, I think it, it's why it's so important for the beginning that there's a clear, um, that we're very clear on how we're going to measure success and to not, to know also that not all campaigns necessarily are going to be directly attributable to revenue. Now, clearly anything, any company does at all, whether it's a blog, a podcast or whatever, they're doing that with the intent to ultimately drive revenue for the business. However, you can't evaluate every single campaign that way. It wouldn't make sense because not everything's direct response. You're going to have other campaigns that have different types of goals and things that are not as trackable. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't track it. It means that you track everything that can be tracked and use other ways, qualitative methods, asking people how you heard, uh, how they heard about you and all sorts of things like that. So there's that that I wanted to mention. And the other thing to give like a really practical example, which I'm sure you know, but to your point, I totally agree with you. A lot of people waste a lot of money on demand gen and, you know, all sorts of related acting. Of course, that's all sorts of channels, right? That's not just paid, but paid's a really easy way to spend a lot of money and waste it very quickly. And so a perfect example that uh, we see all the time is Google ads is usually where a lot of people like to start because it's usually a little bit lower funnel. They're searching for something, searching for a solution. You can try to convert those people. But a lot of times people are focused too much on low intent types of keywords that do not actually have intent to buy. So they're wasting a lot of money and paying Google a ton of money on words like CRM instead of CRM software. And so the, those little those little changes start to make a huge difference because when I'm looking for something and I really want a tool to do something, I'm typing in tool or platform or software or training or insights based on the, the type of company or agency, consultancy, all these types of words mean I'm looking for something. So just even those things itself um, start to make huge differences in the money that you're actually spending on a channel like Google Ads. And so, um, so there's that and, you know, I could go down a whole rabbit hole on a whole bunch of other things, but you're right. There's uh a lot of things need to be done to make sure the programs you are running and the things you're doing with the limited resources, limited budget are on the right things that are also going to drive some of the short-term results, but also think about the longer picture, which is, of course, always easier said than done. It, and I agree, just as long as people don't conflate the two, right? I mean, there are, you know, you look, if you're going to do high intent uh, keywords or leads, that is that is direct response, right? And, and 100% totally. Track. Totally. Um, if you start getting more into sort of less intent, but more, I don't know, educational, um, educational stuff, that's fine, right? If you, yep. then you, your goal should be, okay, we want them to watch, watch the demo or download the white paper. Exactly. You know, and that, and then you have to have some level, some hypothesis that hopefully will be tested over time that, that sure. that actually does lead to a sale. hundred percent. Uh, as opposed to. I don't know, doing a podcasting and getting a bunch of random people to show up that, that don't fit in your ICP is it's like, okay, uh, you know, I just, I didn't really accomplish anything. Um, totally. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, of course you want everything to have some type of journey and, you know, like a lot of times through the, how did you hear about us form on a website or having sales of a process to ask people can provide other indicators that maybe are not trackable by click-based attribution. So there's things you can do like that, that, that help kind of 
fill that journey in and understand, okay, cool. Yes, the podcast was a good idea. You know, we should do more of that because we're interviewing the people that are in our ICP. They're good conversations. They're people that are getting value from this, that are now going to hear about our brand, associate that with the people that are on the podcast and all sorts of things. So, um, and I do agree with you that, that, well, we always struggle to double click with branding. You know, we, we actually do the first sort of like uh, true branding study to show that branding does work. And, mm. and, you know, we always tell companies that, you know, branding is, I don't know, we call it, you know, call it artillery, right? It doesn't win you the war, but it softens up the, the, uh, uh, the defense. So, so when the trips do move in, your sales folks, people have heard of you, you know, when, when they get the message from, from the SDR or the phone call from the AAC, right. they, they've heard of you. They know something about you. Uh, oh yeah. And that, and I'm sure you run into this all the time. That's really undervalued. Um, but you know, to do that in the beginning is kind of tough. Um, depends on the stage. Yeah. It depends on the stage. And a lot of times, like when you're really early on, you know, pre a million dollars or even, even below that, you don't have a rev op, rev ops function or someone that's just sitting there all day, making sure data is moving between systems correctly. So sometimes that stuff comes later, which makes it very difficult clearly to optimize for things that are working when you don't have data around it. So to your point on measurement and having an understanding of what's working and what's not, a lot of times those are the issues that we see commonly is like the data is either not accurate or, or, you know, it's not piping in correctly, or you've got multiple different CRMs and they're not communicating with one another. And so, for example, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll send up offline conversions, which just means sending up opportunity data into a channel like Google ads. So then we can understand, okay, wait a minute, these five, 10 keywords, whatever it may be, these are the ones that ultimately actually convert to um, convert to opportunities. So why aren't we doubling down on some of those keywords more than the others, even though these other keywords are cheaper, they're cheaper cost per lead, but they're not converting into opportunities. So, you know, those little things, like if the data is not accurate in the CRM, like it makes those things really, really challenging. I, I want to. I want to smack people that always, that will talk about, oh, these keywords are cheaper or these leads are cheaper. Or, it's like, there's two things there. One, who cares? Uh, which exactly is, is cost per, cost per uh, uh, acquisition. Exactly. Uh, CAC, 100%. CAC. And the other one is that um, sometimes people will, will say, okay, well, you know, this was more expensive, but it will, will spend, spend less. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. It's like, if something is profitable, you spend as much as you can. You keep you keep driving it up until the point where you know, it's it's not not profitable. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I could. Yeah, I think you it's said it well. About the cheapest lead is not about the cheapest cost per acquisition. Is is right. you're looking for those scalable channels? Uh, why do you think that is? I mean, why do you think there is still that? Because I mean, I agree with you, um, but I know there's also a lot of people that are still optimizing for the cheapest cost per lead and they're trying to drive just a higher quantity of them. Why do you think that is? Because to me, that's a huge inefficiency problem. This whole conversation about growth at all costs versus actually being sustainable and thinking about how you drive efficient growth for a SaaS company. Because I think it's, it's really about, I mean, I spent 10 years in this, in this the double click. So I was, yeah, I was always harping on it. I, it's basically, it's just people are, they're not stupid. They're just ignorant. They just don't know. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's what are the KPIs? And if you're, you know, measuring cost per lead, cost per click, mm-hmm. it's just the wrong KPIs. It's cost per acquisition. It's CAC. Yeah. CAC, CAC per channel. It's all you care about. Then the next mm-hmm. question is, can I scale this channel? That's where mm-hmm. I can put my resources behind. Exactly. I would you know, say it, though. It does, it does get into the payback time, right? I mean, yeah. you know, you know, look at you. I've seen people who have, have almost immediate payback, you know, like, well, why aren't you putting you know, right, more money? Why aren't you, why aren't you yeah. putting as much as you can? Right. You get a bucket, you get two bucks back immediately. I mean, they just don't, it's right. just, I don't know. Yeah. I would say this though, and I think you kind of alluded to it earlier, maybe you have a different opinion, but I, I do think, I mean, leading indicators are not dead. Uh, they're still important, right? You need traffic and you need impressions and you need clicks ultimately to get um, people to your site to convert, whether that's paid or another mechanism. It doesn't have to be paid. And so, especially when you're selling um, a higher transaction value product, you know, something that's $50,000, right? Where you're to your point, there's going to be a lag time between running a campaign, 
getting leads, converting those into opportunities, and for sure, closing them. And so uh, when you're looking at the data, you can't iterate quite as fast as you would for, say, a more transactional SaaS product that's, say, sub $10,000 or even sub $1,000 a month, right? And so I think a lot of times, I think the position that a lot of marketers in um, are we need to still latch on to some type of indicator or some type of leading indicator to say, hey, we think we're getting some signals in the right direction. For example, we use Sixth Sense or Zoom intent data, and we're seeing more companies come into our list that are a good fit for our company after running, say, a couple of different brand awareness campaigns focused on this core messaging. And that was ultimately our goal. And now those campaigns are not direct response, but we are starting to see these initial signals. So now we can redirect SDR efforts or AE efforts to focus and prioritize those accounts. So I think there's kind of like always the balance of, to your point, totally agree. You got to keep in mind, what's the cost per opportunity? What's CAC look like? How much revenue have we brought in per this program or, or, or overall? But also keep in mind too, that especially in your longer like enterprise types of situations, you're going to have to look at some of those initial indicators. Otherwise, you're going to be dead in the water saying, like, where's the revenue? You're like, well, I mean, we got a nine month, 10 month sales cycle. So there's not going to be for a while. So you're going to have to report something. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so a, a couple of things there. Um, yeah. There's a lot, lot to unpack. So yeah, there are definitely, Please. you should have early indicators that you have high degree of confidence in. Um, mm -hmm. and by the way, maybe the average sales 10 months, but maybe 10% of your sales come within a month. So you, you know, you actually could have indicators. Sure. The other thing where I think people really, really screw up is the, there, there's a lot of steps between someone seeing an ad and buying a product. Mm -hmm. They tend to focus yeah. on, all right, well, let's, let's get people to come to our website. Mm -hmm. What we try to, what we do is we have people, we don't always do it, but from start at the end, someone buys your product. What do they do before that? They negotiate a contract. They, you know, have a demo. They do, you know, all the way through until they see an ad. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then really focus on optimizing. People forget it. If you can, we had a, we had a, a, a one of our press, um, portfolio companies 4X their, their uh, visit to conversion to, hmm. to uh, lead. Wow, that's awesome. And when you do that, I mean, that opens up your marketing. All of a sudden, you know, mm -hmm. the stuff that didn't work, all of a sudden works really, 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 really well. <laughs> we had a, exactly. one of our portfolio companies that they were negotiating, they were losing too many people at the contract negotiations. And they were giving all these, you know, people, people get into contract negotiation, the MSA, and they were giving all these things, right? They just started off with this sort of egregious contract and then they would go right. to, to, uh, to a reasonable contract. Oh, and I'm like, well, if you always end up with a reasonable contract, you know, first, if you give someone an egregious contract, you look like an asshole, you know, <laughs> right. And yeah. so they moved to, they moved to a, to a, to just a, a standard, you know, friendly, you know, mutually friendly contract and they doubled their, their, um, their conversion. Yeah. And so. People focus, they focus sort of at the beginning and the end, but they don't focus on all those intermediate steps. You know, is the lead form. We, we did a, a, we went to all the portfolio companies and we did a, uh, an audit on their whole, their whole process. People don't have phone numbers. You know, mm -hmm. you have a hot, so there's no way to call, you know, you got a hot prospect. They can't call you. They can't talk to anyone. Yeah. Uh, we, we had people were asking too much information. It was being lost in the scroll box. I mean, there's people had. Uh, the call to action was, was hidden. It was like the wrong, you know, it was just, it, you see it all the time. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred percent. Once, once you optimize on this stuff, then marketing's, you know, starts really, really working well. Right. And that, and that's so important, right? I mean, we talked about targeting, but I think the other thing below targeting is a little bit of what you were alluding to is hopefully once they get to the website and even within the ads itself, messaging is is so critical. And I think a lot of people get too carried away with design and organization. I think if you, you got to have a, a good enough looking professional website, but ultimately to your point about lead forms and other things like before they even get to the lead form though, what is it? Who is it for? Who else uses it? And what's it going to do for me in terms of value or outcome? And if I can't understand those three or four things within the first section or two of your website, I'm gone. And so that's why so much, you know, time always goes into the homepage typically, or at least the top sections, because if you can't, I mean, just like anything, I mean, like when you're writing any type of ad copy, 
their goal is to get people from one one sentence to the next sentence to the next sentence and so on and so forth, right? And so the same thing applies to a website. And so you need to move them down through that, not funnel, but move them down through the page, et cetera. So ultimately they feel confident like, okay, cool, this is for me. And then to your point, then you get the lead form optimization. Yeah. You're right. I've seen it a thousand times over where you've got, well, we want to know where they live and we want to know what their favorite pizza yeah. is and all this other stuff, right? And you get in this whole range and it's like, well, wait a minute, you're killing your conversion rates because you're asking for way too much. And then it's like, what are you going to do with that information? And then, oh, by the way, there's technology that can enrich that anyway. So you can cut a lot of those fields out and use Clearbit or other tools like it to go ahead and just get all the data into your CRM. And so, you know, I don't know. These are just little things that just can be done that are honestly not that difficult. The messaging thing, I think, is a difficult one. That's always a challenge early on to really nail that. Um, that's something that you constantly are kind of iterating on. But yeah. And, and to your point there, I, mean, I think people, you want to go to the close, right? They want to buy me now, you know, give me a lead. It's like, well, wait a second. You haven't right. built that trust up, you know, like take your time, you know. Exactly. Tell them, tell them why, um, why they should sign up for a demo and how it's going to benefit them. And yeah, exactly. Well, no, one last thought, and then let's close out on one last question, big question here. But um, I mean, the other thing, we had a case study with a Series B now SaaS company that went from, I think it was like two or three marketing sourced opportunities per uh, month to, I think it was around 25 or 30 or something like that. And it took some time ultimately to get there. But, you know, some of this stuff, like it doesn't happen overnight. And we did a lot of different testing along the way, ultimately to get there. So there's a lot of things that happen. I think this point of what you said earlier, it's not like you just see an ad and you come in there. There were all these different points that kind of happened along the way. So I don't give all credit to advertising whatsoever to this. It was a very good business strategy of here's what we're going to be. Who's who, uh, these are the people we're targeting. Here are the messages we're going to put out there, so on and so forth. And we aligned with that. And ultimately, over a six-month period, we started to drive much better results. And now, of course, a lot of those deals are now closing into revenue. Uh, but a lot of times, we're just aligning on like how much pipeline was driven, how many number, how many opportunities were created, what's the velocity through the pipe, and all those things to make sure that we're driving efficiency through it. And if we can do those things well, then clearly, you know, you can get good results, but uh, not without good messaging. So, um, well, cool. Well, let me uh, let me close on one thing real quick. So I wanted to ask you, you know, what the rest of 2023, because 2030 is, I mean, this year is going to be kind of, uh, it's already been a little bit wacky. I mean, budgets have been cut with a lot of uh, marketing teams and just in general, broadly, not just marketing specifically. And you continue to have layoffs across a number of huge companies, but tons in the SaaS space. And I wanted to kind of get your take on how the rest of 2023 is going to ride out for this of the year from either an investment perspective, from a growth perspective, and maybe some things maybe just people should be thinking about. So I wrote a, I wrote a piece on this last, uh, last summer, uh, just when, it's, when this stuff all started hitting the fan. Yeah. Uh, and it was just sort of, how is this? It was deja vu all over again, you know, for the dot com, you know, how is this the same? How is it different? And it is very different. Um, you know, the dot com area was, money, it was a very insular, insular, um, you know, it was one internet company giving money to another internet, internet company, internet yep. company that all came from IPOs. You know, the SaaS market is pretty, you know, it's very highly diversified. It's in, you know, many, many different in industries. I think if you're a SaaS company, sell the SaaS companies, you're going to have a problem. If you're mm -hmm. a SaaS company selling, you know, construction or healthcare, or, you know, a, a huge diverse group of, group of clients. Mm -hmm. Um, you're in pretty good shape. Um, you know, SaaS is, you know, I, I would encourage people to s spend more time on how are you going to make people money or how are you going to save them money? Uh, so it's got to be mm. you know, a real, real value proposition. But, mm. you know, I mean, SaaS makes companies more efficient. Uh, it's quite good. Yeah. Um, I think you are seeing people where the money is being pulled back. Uh, as you said, it's not growth at any cost. Uh, and people are, you know, before it was like, okay, I can have a six month runway. And if I'm growing, I'm going to raise money. No problem. People mm -hmm. now are really, you know, we push companies to be two year runway uh, if possible. Right. Right. But companies should be paranoid. You know, I, it, it's, if you're, uh, if you're growing 200% a year, um, you're going to be able to raise money. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's, there's still a lot of money out there and we're still, we're, we're actively investing. Evaluations right. have gone down. Um, and I think, look, founders have to be, you know, kind of silly conversations. They used to be public companies are trading at 28x revenue, right? And now it's only, <laughs> now it's down to only, you know, eight 
You know, is it going to rebound? Right. It's, like, it's like, really? Eight times revenue? That That's absurd. You know I mean? That seems Brian fair to me. So yeah, I think founders have to get it out of their head. Yeah. And they definitely have baptism by fire when they're running out of money. You know, they finally see the light. But the problem we run into is, is companies that have, they raise money at super high valuations. And it just doesn't help them. They raise a lot of money and mm. you know, a really high valuation and they've got themselves into this spot where everyone is screwed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. You said one thing, if I, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears and cause you said something that's really interesting actually, that I think is worth maybe just digging into for one second before we jump around this time. But, um, with, uh, with budget cuts happening, I think the big complaint that I feel like a lot of marketers have, and I just wanted to see if you're seeing the same thing is that a lot of times the targets really aren't changing. And so they're having to take the same less money to be able to hit the same goal or sometimes even higher goals, uh, based upon what they promised to either the board, investors, et cetera, based on growth targets they're needing to hit to raise their next round. And I was curious, do you see targets moving as much to compensate for decrease in budget? Or do you see the same thing where a lot of SaaS, SaaS targets, rather, in terms of their goals, revenue goals, and, and others are staying relatively the same, even despite what's going on? I think it's gone. I think the the, the forecasting has gone down. And people are saying, look, I, I if I can show decent growth and extend my runway, I'm going to take that path rather than yeah. sort of rolling the die and, and, you know, trying to go for blowout growth. Right. Um, and run out of money. So, you know, like I would yeah. encourage all marketers is, and this has always been a, a plague of, of, of marketing mm -hmm. is you got to be a data driven business. You got to show, you have to, you got to convince people that, mm -hmm. you know, I spent a buck and I got three bucks back and I can do this and repeat, rinse and repeat. Mm -hmm. Um, but too many times, you know, too many times marketers tend to be a little, they're less quantitative and more, let's say creative. That just doesn't right. fly in these markets. I mean, I remember exactly. double clicking, you know, advertising brand, especially brand advertising, first thing they got cut. Um, mm -hmm. Part of it is just the nature of the business that, you, you know, for, for like an agency, you know, I can, I can stop spending, um, you know, on television and I don't affect any employees and, you know, to, yeah. you know, to lay anyone off and it's an agency, you know, sure. you know life sure. of an agency is very tough. Um, sure. But then I think there's a people, you know, pendulum swung so far as like, wait a second, we're not, you know, sales have gone down because we're not, we're not, we're not advertising anymore. So. Right. So right. I, I think that you do to prove it. Direct response is actually kind of cyclical to, to, to the economy. Um, yep. Advertising becomes cheap. Direct response works better. You know, more money goes towards it. So. Exactly. Exactly. Data. Good points, man. Well, good chat. Uh, really good chat. I loved it. Um, I guess where can people find you or more about SCOP? Did I say it correctly Scop. in the end? Yeah. SCOP. Thank God. Wow. SCOPVC.com. Uh, SCOPVC.com. Sweet. Um, and the other tool, I think I told you about it, was TeamStormit.com, which was sort of the Team brainstorming. TeamStormit. Yeah. So thinking that brainstorming Storm. tool that we've been, I've been using for I'll have to take a look. I haven't heard of it. Team Stormant. Well, cool, man. Well, then we will uh, pick this up another time. Maybe do this again here in, I don't know, six months, nine months and see where things are uh, from there. But yeah, I think the the takeaway is efficiency is the the way to go and figure out what we can do to drive more programs that are ultimately connected to a good and efficient customer acquisition cost and not just throwing money at the walls and seeing what happens and grabbing a couple clicks. Scalable opportunities. Exactly. That's all about. Love it, my friend. All right, great. Until the next time. Great conversation, Jonathan. Yeah, man. We'll see you. All right. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of the Demand Podcast. Again, I'm Jonathan Bland, the co-founder of OmniLab. I'll also have with me Jason Steele, who's the other co-founder of OmniLab on this podcast as well. Uh, we're a demand gen agency for C to Series B SaaS startups. Um, if you like this episode, uh, or you're looking for some help with demand gen, please feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn over our DM, or you can go just directly to our website. That's omnilabconsulting.com. Otherwise, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode where we'll be talking about all things demand gen. Until then, thanks. Bye-bye.